Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is Romans Education Part 7, and this is Session 4. Well, I left off with you when we were talking about that you're entering a new uh, phase of the education in which you're going to be asked now to be considerate of how you spend your time. And the reason for that is because what we're about to encounter now in the education, because it's more complex. Now, when I say that, I don't mean more complicated, but there's a lot more to the education now, and it's going to require more than what you have been able to do up to this point. And, and that's really what we're looking at in the first part of this verse. So let me, let me take us back to Romans 13, 11, and let's take a look at the first part of this verse. Because I've already told you, this verse, I see it as actually broken into two parts. And by the time we get through looking at them, I think you'll see that too. I think it's evident. I think it's plain. So here it is. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. And if you'll notice, after sleep there's a colon. And you know that when you find a colon in the middle of a sentence, you could actually take phrases on both sides of those colons and they could stand alone as a sentence. And so I'm actually seeing that there is a division there, but even more than that, that, and even though they're related, they're not talking about the exact same thing. The first one is asking you to do something, and the second one after the colon is telling you why this needs to be, as we were talking about at the break, why this needs to be urgent, why this needs to happen. Okay, so this first one, and that knowing the time. Oh, I'm reluctant to do this, but when we talk about knowing the time, what kind of time is it that we're talking about knowing? Knowing is another way to say that, and, and, and knowing the time is to be aware or being aware of what kind of time. What kind of time are we talking about here? It's not the time in your life, and it's not the time of, the, of where you are in the dispensation of grace, it's the time of where you are in this education. So, being aware. You know what? Billy says this to me sometimes. On Sunday mornings, I go out to the office and I'm printing notes and I may get involved in doing stuff. And then the, the, on our phone system, it, there's a little intercom button. You can call the other handsets. And she'll call that handset and she'll go, do you know what time it is? She's not asking me to go, uh, it's 11.30. She's not asking me to do that. She's saying, are you aware of the time? getting close to the time that we leave. You, you, you see, this is what Paul is saying now. Not about the time of day. But be, now I need you to be aware of where you are in the education. So, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time. What, what did we discover high time was? It's the right time, it's the proper time, it's the appointed time, it's the fully come time. And when is that fully come time? Now. Now it is high time. See, now put it together. Knowing where you've come to in the education, you have now come to the proper time to do something. Does everybody understand verse 11 up to this point? Is there any question? Interactive learning, crying out after knowledge. If you don't get it, say something because I need to fill in the blank if I've assumed something here. All right, so now we come to this phrase, now it is high time to awake out of sleep. So what is he talking about when he is talking about this phrase? And let me see if I can highlight this in a little different color then. What is he talking about when he's talking about this phrase? Awake out of sleep, because as I mentioned to you at the front, normally when someone is talking about, boy, you know what, it's high time to wake up, we would think that's saying, boy, you've overslept, you know. But Paul is not accusing us here. He is not saying that we are slothful and we're just laying in bed spiritually all day. You do recognize everybody 
He's not talking about physically being in the bed and going to sleep at night. But I'm going to give you a perfect illustration about what this is first, and then we're going to talk about it in the verse. When Billy and I went down to Temple, Texas, or up to Temple, Texas, when we went up there for Linda's surgery, we were eating supper together the night before, and I said, what time have you got to be in there for surgery in the morning? Because we wanted to see her before she went in. And she said, I have to be there. They told me to be there by 6.30, and I might want to be there a little earlier than that. And so we're at the, we were actually staying in the same hotel, and I said, so what time are y'all leaving the hotel? She said, we're probably going to leave at 6, because really, the hospital was not even a, hardly a tenth of a mile. It was really close. She said, we're going to leave at 6. And so I knew if they're going to leave at 6, and I'm going to see her at the hospital and pray with her before she goes in, I was going to have to get up at a certain time, right? So I give the front desk a time for us to get up. There's a story there, but I'm going to skip the story for now. Everything in my life has a story to it. All right. So we get up. We get up at about five minutes after five. And I know that I'm going to load the car because I'm not coming back to the hotel. And we're not going to get back in time to check out, so I'm just going to load up. So, sorry, I'm back on the story again. Uh, here's my point. If I'd have gotten up at 2 o'clock in the morning, that would have been too early. If I'd gotten up at 7, that would have been too late. I'd have missed her. So instead... I have to, if I'm, going to, if I'm going to see her that morning, which is the last time I'm going to see her, because when the doctor comes out and says everything's gone really good, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, stay for her to have the therapy. You know, we're going to come back, you know, and go to work. So I realize if I don't see her that morning, I'm not going to see her. So we, we're going to see her that morning. What I'm trying to say to you is, to get up at that time and to be there to get this done, I have to get up earlier than I normally would in order to get this done. If you have something on your plate to do that is now exceeding what you normally do and you need more time to get it done, there's an easy way to do that. And what is that way? There's actually three ways to do it, so let's talk about them. What's one way, if you need extra time in the day, what's one way to do that? Get up early. Get up early. And that's what's being talked about here by now, now it is the proper time to awake out of sleep. Because at five in the morning, if I was going to see Linda and get the car loaded and get to the hospital, now it is high time for us to awake out of sleep. Now, there is another way to get more time in a day to do things. And what's, the other, what's another way? Stay up late. And there's a third way. Don't sleep. <laughs> no, the third way is you're going to have, yeah, you're going to have to find time by letting something else you would normally do because it's not nearly as important, or maybe it's just even frivolous, that is going to get replaced with this other thing that is more important. Have you ever done that? Have you ever worked through lunch? There was something that had to get done? Now really, I, look, I have my own opinion about that. I think lunch is way overrated, but that's just my opinion. But, but that's just me. I, I worked through lunch... Every day. That's I, I just don't think about it. And I've done that for many years. But if you eat lunch, I, th I think that's wonderful. I'm not trying to pre present a doctrine contrary to lunch. I'm not the anti-lunch candidate. Okay. Just want to be clear. My point is, I, that was a bad illustration. That's my point. That was a bad illustration. Let me give you a better illustration. You know what? I come to my sonship life 
And I think, you know what? I, there's something about this I really need to work on. Or I really need to be talking to my father about this. So I can do that, or I can watch Dancing with the Stars. Okay, now see, for some of you, that was an easy one, wasn't it? You know. But you understand what I'm saying. In, in the scheme of things, if I watch Dancing from the Stars, I'm not really edified that much. That much being none. But if I, and if you love Dancing with the Stars, which I haven't seen it, but if you like that, hey, I'm not picking on Dancing with the Stars. I just tried to pick something. Wow. But here we go. But my sonship education, if it is the top priority, then you know what? I, yeah, you still have to make a living, right? You still got to work. There are things you have to do, and all of that should be done. That's why just because you're involved in sonship doesn't mean you can neglect your family responsibilities. You still have to do those. But, <coughs> but you're going to have to find time somewhere. There's a preacher up in Gainesville, Texas, who's been following the education. He went through the School of Theology, went through the School of Biblical Studies. He just finished Sonship Orientation. He's about to start Sonship Establishment. And he works a full-time job and pastors a church. And so as a result, and they're not the same thing. His job is totally different. And so in order to get this study done, here's what he does. His, his job doesn't require him to, but he gets up an hour earlier than his job requires, and he spends the first hour of every day from 5.30 to 6.30 in the morning going through the education, going, looking at the DVDs and reading the notes. You know what he did? He found time, and the way he did it was to get up. So for him... This required him to awake out of sleep. I can't wait till he gets to Romans 13 and finds out this is going to require more time. So now what will he do? This will be interesting to find out, won't it? But the amount of time extra is going to be different for us all. Some of us are going to look at this and we're going to go, you know what, here's what I need. But, but you're going to ha that's a sonship decision you're going to have to make. And no one's going to check up on that. But you're going to know if, if you've got it done, and if you don't, you'll know. All right, so my point in this is to say, this is really what is at the essence of, it is that now it is high time to wake out of sleep because of the increased demand now of your sonship education. Because of where you are, you have come to a place that's going to require more time and effort. And because of that, it is now high time. It's the, it, it, you couldn't do it earlier than this, and you don't want to put it off. Right now is the right time to begin making wise, judgmental decisions about how you use your time, because you're going to need more time, and it's going to take more effort from this point forward than ever before. And you're going to have to make those sonship decisions. And as you find that time, wherever it is, that's what's being described when he says, wake out of sleep. He's not and you knew he wasn't talking about literally getting in the bed. But he is talking about this being the way that you are going to... Because when you're asleep, you're not getting things done. Now, back in Proverbs 6... There is a companion passage, kind of to this, a parallel passage to this, that says, and we're going to get over there and look at that, but it's going to talk about how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? And, and, you know, you're always sleeping, a little folding of the hands to sleep, and it's going to talk about that issue. And it's going to talk about a son being sluggard. But this is not talking about a son being sluggard. I'm absolutely, 100%, fully persuaded. And you don't hear me say that very often. You hear me say it like this. This is how I understand it. And if I'm wrong later, I'll come back and eat crow and make it right. And if I'm wrong about this, I'll come back and eat crow and make it right. I'll probably blame it on Karen, but we'll, we'll come back and we'll do that. Yes. But you know what? I'm not concerned about getting this one wrong because I see how this fits. This really is not a rebuke about being so slothful that you're spiritually laying in the bed all day. 
This is about waking out of sleep, is saying the time has come now that you have something that needs to be done that wasn't even on your plate before. And in order to get this done, there is a high time that you, in other words, you know what? You need to set your alarm to get up to give yourself time to get this done. It's not something you're used to doing, so it's out of the ordinary. And that waking out of sleep is being accomplished whenever you find the time. And it doesn't matter if it's early in the morning or before you go to bed at night and you stay up a little later or if you replace something of less importance. And that's the one that you're going to find more often than not. Because you're going to realize something. You're going to realize what the last half of the verse says. And when you realize that, all of a sudden you're going to start looking around at the things that you are involving your time in as a son, and you're going to go, whoa, wait a minute. And now we'll talk about that last half of the verse. This is also going to require more, when I say more time and effort, can I just give you a few of the areas that I'm talking about that in? Not just more time to, I'll guarantee you, on my end, it has taken me way more time and effort to dig this out than the stuff that came before. But it will take more time for us to implement this stuff into our life. When we're presented with this doctrine, and you're going to have to spend more time. I'm really glad we went through that deal on prayer. Because it's going to take more time with your Heavenly Father talking to Him about how you plan to implement this and the searching of the heart. Am I really looking at this the right way? And here's why I'm thinking about it this way. Because I'm going back to your word and I'm seeing this. And if you can't say that, then that's an indication that you've kind of dreamed something up in your mind and you need to back up from that and take another look at it. That's the way that works. But this is going to take more time. Now look, I'm not trying to give you a time element. I'm not trying to say that if you spent you know, X number of minutes a day in prayer now that later you're going to need Y number of minutes. I'm, I'm not trying to say it that way. But it is going to work to where you're, it's, you're going to be talking about things you... You'll still be talking about the other things, but now you have more to talk about. Does that make sense? And so you're going to have to find the time to do this. And, and that's, what's, that, that's what's at the heart of the first part of uh, verse 11. Um, and, that, and now I want to say one more thing about that before we move on. And the reason that this is so critical is because we are now being introduced to an area that we, up to this point, haven't had anything to do with. We couldn't. We weren't able. And right at the end of the first session, I took a few minutes and talked about that issue, that this is happening at just the right time. And your father knows that by coming down to this point in the education, by the way, by the way, you want me to show you something very interesting? What comes after judgment? Thank you. Equity. There's two components to wisdom. Two to justice and two to judgment, and then you start equity. And for us, we got ours, our, 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 our I feel like an, a seal, I don't know. Where's the ball? I'll put it on my nose. Um, okay, now I almost lost my train of thought. We get this exhortation to awake out of sleep right in the middle of our. Uh, instruction in judgment. In other words, the first part, we've, that's verses 8 to 10. This is verses 11 to 14. And right in between them, that's when we get this exhortation. In Israel's program, they don't get this exhortation until they get into the first part of equity. It's just one of those differences that takes place between Israel's program and ours. Now, because I, I, I can identify it over in Proverbs. It doesn't happen at the same place ours does. Now, if you ask me to explain why theirs is inequity, I can't answer that. Because we're going to be judging angels and they're going to be on the Well, I mean, there is some distinction in the program, and that may well be it. I, I, but I just, can't, I just can't put my finger on it and go, 
If I was teaching the believing remnant and they, and they were to say to me, how come they got it earlier than us? I'd be going like, well, you know what, they're special. I, you know, I don't know. You know so. I know that works for us, doesn't it? Yeah, okay, we're special. My point in, in bringing that up is to say there is an admonition for, the, for them over there and there is this, this warning about not being a slothful son, but that's not what is taking place in Romans 13, 11. What he's telling you is, now that you've come to the place in the education that you have come to, things are about to change and it's going to be more demanding and you're going to have to start making wise, judgmental decisions about how you spend your time if this is going to work. And if you're not going to do that, then forget about this working because it's necessary. This is on top of everything that you've gotten up to this point. Okay. Now, let's talk about the second half of the verse. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Now, there's a lot of different ways that we can define the word salvation. Let's talk about it. Let me get a black marker. What? what? We've, already, we've already X'd one out. One of them is, let's just call it salvation from the debt and penalty of our sin. So we'll just say salvation from sin. But that's not what it's talking about. How do we know that? Because now is our salvation nearer than when... Nearer? Are you kidding me? That's in the past, right? We have been justified. Did you get a new identity? Did you get your sins forgiven? Did you get the righteousness of Christ imputed to you? Did you get a permanent at one minute? Well, that's not nearer. That's, that's further back in the past. So that's not what the salvation is. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. What's another thing that we get saved from? What's another thing that we can have salvation concerning? Okay, I'm going to go fix something to drink. And oh, okay. well, what did you say? Okay, I got two of them there. Mark gave me one, Karen gave me one. Here it is. You can be saved from the effects of the sufferings of this present time. Right? And that's what the comfort and the peace and the long-suffering and the strength in your inner man and all of those other things that we talked about over and over, those are the things that keep you from being overwhelmed by the sufferings that are just part of living in a fallen world. Now, Mark said there's also an attack from the policy of evil. And it's funny that he would bring that up because actually when we get into the next verses and he talks about casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light, that really is talking about the policy of evil and what it is able to do. Not generally in the world to everyone, but look, look at this, look at this. But to a son who has come to a certain place in his education because now he can be looked at as though he is a real threat. You say, well, weren't we a real threat before? You were a potential threat. But to some degree, every believer is a potential threat. What if one day they find out about sonship? You see? But when you get to this, you're not just a potential threat anymore. Now, by the way, let me make you feel better about it. And we said it, so I just have to remind you of it. Just because you're reading Romans 13, 11 doesn't mean you have all the doctrine that makes you that threat. But you're, this is your initial instruction in it. This is where you get introduced to it. And the very first things you're told about it are right here. Are we going to get more about this over in Corinthians? You better believe we are. Okay, but, but from this we'll be saved from the from the effects of the attack of the policy of evil. And you already know the answer to this question. The attack of the policy of evil is meant to do one thing. And what is that thing? To make you stop and quit your sonship life. And so, though, and by the way, if you do stop, those attacks will go away. But there is something, there is a doctrine that saves you from those attacks, not from them happening. You understand when I'm saying it that way. They're saving you from being overwhelmed and overcome or from those attacks being successful by making you more than a conqueror. That's something we already know about. And so 
That, that's something else that we get saved about. There's another salvation. <laughs> you get saved. Do you remember back in Romans 8? And he talked about the bondage of corruption and the creature being under the bondage of corruption and the whole creation is under the bondage of corruption. And we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. What's next? The redemption of our body. And the remember the, ver the look, 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 just look at this. Maybe, did I put it in the notes? No. Okay. Mm, I'm off track. This is not good. Romans 8. Let's just look at it real quickly. Let me show you this. I didn't, I did, when I wrote the notes, I wasn't thinking we were going to do this exercise, but I think this is profitable. Romans chapter 8, and look with me at verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. What's the first part of the next verse say? For we are saved by hope. There is a hope that becomes a, that has a salvation component to it. It's the hope that one day this body that's under the bondage of corruption is going to be redeemed. Remember, the redemption of our body. You know what you got promised there? This isn't the body you're going to have to deal with forever. What's the difference between hope and grace? Well, grace, in the beginning, grace is how it's given to you. It's given to you as a free gift. Hope is something you don't have yet. Or it wouldn't be hope. Remember, let me read the rest of the verse to you here. For we, we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? In other words, if you already had a redeemed body, you wouldn't hope for it. You already have it. But there is a hope. In other words, you, you, all the issues that you've had physically, Bob... Here's what this does. There is a comfort. This hope gives you a comfort to know that God hasn't overlooked the fact that you're still in that body. You trusted Christ. Your soul and spirit were saved. You were given a new identity. But I thought they were saved by grace. Well, they are. They are saved by grace. But are you, hope, are you hoping your spirit is saved? No, because it already is. Yeah. Well, you know what you're at? You know what? So what about that body? What are you looking forward to with that body? Are you saying, yeah, this is the body I want for eternity? No, I'm looking for... And that's the hope. And that's the hope. It's something, hope is something you don't have yet, but you've been promised it. And that hope isn't like, I, I wish it would happen. The hope is, it's been promised, and I know it's going to happen, and I find comfort in being sure of that. It's like a, a, a certain promise. That's the comfort that a hope gives you. So when he says in that verse, for we are saved by hope, you know what that's saying? Don't worry about this being what you're going to have to put up with from now on. I'm going to do something to redeem this body and all of those kinds of sufferings are going to be done away with. In heaven, you won't have an oxygen tank. In the heavenly, you won't have an oxygen tank in the heavenly places. And you won't have a scooter. Well, I guess you could have if you wanted it, but you won't need it. You won't need it. You, you see, that's the hope. That's something that's out there. So when he says we are saved by hope, what is the hope? What is that hope? That we're going to get our body redeemed, right? Because your body isn't redeemed yet, but he hasn't forgotten about that. That is going to happen. When does your body, you already know the answer to this because we know other scriptures. When does your body get redeemed? After the blessed hope. Oh, it's the blessed hope, okay. And isn't it a coincidence? That's what that's called, the blessed hope. What's the other term we use to describe that? The rapture, the rapture. right. That's, that's this event right here. That body is changed and then we get caught up to meet the Lord. And you know what? That is the completion of your salvation, isn't it? That means you're already, your soul and spirit are saved. What happens at that hope? 
You're now the last part. It's the part you're waiting on, isn't it? Well, it says it in the verse, for if we... We'll just look at the verse there. It says, For if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience what? Wait for it. You're waiting for that, aren't you? And so if that's the part that you're waiting on, when that comes, you know what that is? That is the com That hope represents the completion of your salvation. Do you get that? It, there's nothing else now to be said. There, that's all done. Right? At the blessed hope, at the rapture, does this body get redeemed? Will it be sick anymore? Will it be hurt anymore? Will it get old and be under the bondage of corruption anymore? It will not. How about your soul and spirit? Are they saved still? So you're going to be a complete package, right? Alright, so what is this talking about then? For now is our salvation nearer when we believed. This is the one I believe that this salvation is referring to right here. The completion of our salvation. In other words, the thing that wraps all of this up. But watch, when that happens, what do you know is true about your opportunity to get educated and to put it into practice and get skilled with it? That opportunity is over. And that's what he's telling you. You want me to put verse 11, the end part, in a nutshell? By the way, it doesn't matter what you want to call the salvation. You want to call it salvation from the effects of the policy of evil? For now is our salvation nearer than we believe. I don't care how you define salvation. The fact that time is ticking away, it is nearer every day than it was from the day before. So if someone online wants to say, hey, I don't agree that that's what the salvation is, you're a son, you can make that decision. But no matter how you define salvation, you won't change the gist of what this part of the verse is saying. Every day represents one last day you have to get this sonship education and put it to use and get skillful with it. What this is saying, in a nutshell, is that your opportunity is diminishing constantly. Now when you're 20 years old, you don't think of it that way. And I am here to tell you that when you get over 60, you think about that more than you ever did when you were 20 or 30. Because when you're 20, you're an idiot. I don't care who you are. You're just an imbecile. You have, I don't, some people, I don't think they wake up till they're after 20. I don't even think they're in the world till after that. But here we go. That's my opinion again. But anyway... I've met some, okay. Oh, all right, all right, off of that, off of that. Okay, here we go. The idea is that you only have so much time. That's the motivator. Now let's put the whole thing together. And knowing where you, and knowing the time of where you are in this education, that now that you've come to this point, it is high time, it's the proper time to... Start making wise, judgmental decisions about how you spend your time because you've only got so much time to get this education up and running. And if you waste your time and you don't get this, you are what, you, you know what, really? You're, at, you're actually not valuing the education the way it ought to be valued. You're really not looking at it for what it really is meant to provide. And if you're just, if, and if you just approach life, and I'll tell you, we'll do this at the end, but let me just say this once now. One of the big reasons that people do that is because there's something else that is taking their time that they actually believe is more important. That's just the truth of the matter. You know what I found out? Somebody that want, when you and by the way, we're going to talk about this, but when someone is saying, hey, you know what? We're getting to a new place in the curriculum. It's going to require more time and effort. There's two responses to that. One of them is to go, oh, you're killing me. 
I'm already spending time. You know how many times we watch those DVDs? Oh my goodness. Or you know how many times I read the notes? I'm tired of your misspellings. I'm tired of the fact that you use the word that 40 times in every paragraph. I know I do that. There it is. <laughs> or there that is. <laughs> I said it again. Look, if you look at this and you say, hey, I'm going to have to up my commitment in, with regard to my time. Uh, let me balance this out. God is not asking any of us to move off to a cave, take our Bible, <laughs> and just spend the rest of our life with our nose stuck in our Bible. You realize your sonship life is meant to have an impact as you live a life out in this world. So don't think that. As I told you the last time we talked about Romans 13, God is not saying you have watched your last football game, if you're interested in that. Okay, your last dancing with the stars. Okay, just to make up. This is, okay, Serena's giving me that look. Do you watch Dancing with the Star? Okay, all right. See, I'm sorry I picked that. I should have picked something else. She wanted me to pick football. I wouldn't do it. Okay. So anyway, you understand. <laughs> That's right. So you, if you look at this, you're going like, oh man, this is going to... Now, that's an indication of something. And I'm going to tell you what that is, and we'll talk about it, that something back here in Romans 8 didn't get fully settled in you. The other, uh, the other approach is to say, hey, you know what? I've been looking forward to this. I've been wanting to be able to deal with the adversary effectively. I've been wanting to labor with my father in making a huge impact on a realm I can't even see with my physical eyes. I've been waiting for the day when my father could equip me and turn me loose on that guy. Now, if you've been waiting for that, you're now in the initial education of that. And if you've been saying, I really haven't been looking forward to this. But you know what? The benefit of what this doctrine gives us is way more than what we're being called on in order to get it. And I hate to say it that way, but the payoff is way more than the price it takes. So let me say this and I'll, I'll catch you. When I was uh, early in the ministry, I used to write down these little sayings in the middle of my Bible. And for the most part, there were just little sayings that were like that and th they weren't effectual working or anything like that. But there was some truth in them and I'm going to give you one of them now. Because when it comes to finding the extra time to get this part of your education, I had this little saying written down, is in the top three of the list, and I probably had a hundred of them in my list. And it said this, He who wants to bad enough will find a way, and he who does not will find an excuse. And that's the truth of it. And, in a, and it, were you going to say that? Was that what you were going to say? You, what were you going to say? This is the first piece of armor you take on. By the way, when does anybody put on armor? That's exactly right. For the first time, your father is going to talk about entering into battle with the adversary. And you're going to put on the very first piece of armor. It's not until you get to the advanced epistles of Ephesians that you put on the full armor. But this is all you need right here. You understand? You're not walking out there with a bulletproof vest and here comes the adversary in a tank. You know, you're not going to be looking at, uh-oh, I don't have enough armor on. Well, a flashlight will break through the dark. You know, a flashlight goes through the dark. It does. Well, there's some things that we're going to look at as we go through these verses. I think you're going to be thrilled to see them. But it is going to require more out of us. And the thing that's supposed to motivate us is to remember, we, and, 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 and I understand that when you're young, you have this idea, my whole life is in front of me. But really, do we have the promise of that? Because we live in a fallen world, you don't know how long you do have. So, you know what? Rather, it is the end of the dispensation of grace, or rather, it is the end of your life, you only have 
a, a diminishing window and you don't know how big that window is. You just don't know. We know the way it normally works. And so if that's true, even then, I'm looking at, I tell you what I'm looking at, I need every opportunity I have to get this thing up and running in me. That's what I want. And that's what the end of verse 11 is meant to produce in you. Just remember, when you get kind of get, I hate to use this word, but when you get lulled to sleep, that you've got plenty of time. That's a very dangerous position. So if I can kind of misuse that verse a little bit, now it's high time to awake out of sleep. You have got to come to the conclusion that I'm going to have to start making wise judgments about how I spend my time. And, the, and, and, and gosh, the thing went off. Did I turn that off? Ow. Look, oh, I have too many verses left. We'll do them next time. We'll do them next time. Because here's the thing that I want you to understand. Well, if we talk about that, I need verses. Okay, we won't talk about them. We'll do them next time. There's two important things that are left that we need to look at. And uh, one of them has to do with our response to this. Now, I'm going to tell you what I expect is happening in this group. I expect that this group is ready to get to this next level of the education. I really do. Now... I think this group is, is ready to get to the next level of the education. I think that's what we want. I don't think there's anybody looking at this going, oh man, I'm so wore out with this. I don't think that's happening. I think everybody really wants to get this. And I think we're going to have the right response to this. But if you have a response to this that says, man, I just, I can't believe I'm being called on to... You know, the, oh man, extra time, where am I going to get that? If that's the response, I'm going to take you over to, to Proverbs 6, and I'm going to show you the sluggard son. And the father's going to tell that sluggard son, yeah, I know that's Israel's program, but you know what he does with them? The first words that he says to them is, it's almost a little bit of a, uh, a, a put down. Because here's what he says to the sluggard son, go to the ant. And consider her ways. <laughs> You're a son. You need to go to the ant and learn something. You know what? That's a, that's a little bit of a, of a put down, isn't it? Like it, it, you, This is your reaction toward what you're being offered here? Uh, look, look down here. Here's an ant that doesn't have any, any overseer or ruler. And yet, it prepares its meat. And in the harvest, it, it gathers... And you know what he's saying to the son? Even the ant knows how to prepare for the future. And this education, you got a big, long future ahead of you, and this education is what's preparing you for that. And, th and the way you're looking at this like, ah, you know what, I really need, not Dancing with the Stars, I really need uh, American Idol. <laughs> okay, I got somebody else on that one, huh? You, you know what I'm saying, there's a sluggard son that doesn't respond properly. There's something going on. And when we come back next time, I'm going to point you back at just a couple of places, maybe two or three in Romans 8, to say either this didn't really fully get in your thinking or this didn't or this didn't. All I have to do is, I'm not going to teach them to you. I'm just going to show them to you. And I'll be able to say them in just a sentence or two each. But my point is, I want us to understand that the proper attitude that should have been developed in us back there about the value of this education and the importance of this education and the ability to look down the road and know what this education is providing for and the big deal that it really is is enough that when he just says what he says in verse 11 that, you know what? The time that you have for this, however long that is, you may die before that or the dispensation may end before that. But either way, that time is good. And every day, you're one day less to having that opportunity. And if that means anything to you, if this education means anything to you, then you're going to start making wise decisions about how you spend your time. Does that make sense? Now see, to me, that, that's...
perfect fit for what we're... This is, the, this is what's going on in verse 11, and then in verse 12, then we start encountering, encountering the doctrine that we just got told that we're going to have to start making allowances for. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. I'm so excited about the things that we're talking about and the things that we have yet to talk about. Uh, I, I hope, Lord, that this verse has gripped the hearts of the folks here like it has me. It, it is something that has made, even, even though there's nothing about this that we've talked about, I really didn't know. I knew the opportunity is shrinking. But for these, this verse to do its work in our inner man and really convince us that now we're about to enter into a part of our education that really is going to require us to awake out of sleep. It's going to require us to find time to get this education done. And we realize that our opportunity to do so is shrinking every day. May we make wise, judgmental decisions about how we use our